Walk me through it. Walk me through it. What identity are we going to introduce? Uh, oh, okay. I was just going to categorize. Okay, so you, you, you can, um, yeah, I suppose you can say well, that's 5 on x outside of x minus 1. I think we're confident that you can mentally do that. All you really need is that, that pair of factors, right? So now what identity will I introduce on the basis of that? A on x. Yep. Fantastic. Okay, now when you go ahead and you put those together into one fraction, you're getting this. And I'm just going to put that back into its unfactorized form. And then of course you do the same comparison of coefficients. What did you get for A? Yeah. Fantastic. So, therefore, what I have done is taken something which, again, if I were to say, hey, can you integrate this? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> um, the derivative of that, like, f dash, if I wanted this to be f, doesn't even have any x's up there. At least over here, I was like kind of in the ballpark, but here you're really up the creek with that paddle. But here I can now say, all right, um, I will write the original. By the way, please make sure that you actually say this line when they say decompose it into a partial fraction. Don't just stop with A and B. You've got you to take A and B back to where they belong. So there's A. Uh, that's a minus. Now, it actually, it's, it's, it's at that point, it does not really matter whether you say they're congruent or equal and always equal, identical, or whether you say they're equal because they're, they're both in fact. Okay, now I'm just going to pause for a minute because I've got a question. Um, I didn't want to cloud your, your process through this question too much by showing you multiple methods at the beginning, but I will just pause since it was raised and show you this anyway. If you have a look at this, the original question we did to demonstrate this principle, at this point, we then uh, launched into this, right? Oh, sorry, not that point, uh, this point. Right? I simplified it so I had all the x terms and all the constant terms, and then I did my comparison. That is not the only way you can work out what A and B are. Okay? If you have a look at this, knowing that the left-hand side and right-hand side are all equal and always equal, right? simply by choosing an appropriate value of x, you can make A and B sort of jump out at you. Okay? For example, you could let x equal 1. Right? Now, if I let x equal 1, see what happens to this thing. This guy just vanishes. Right? Because he becomes zero. This is something like what we were doing with factor theorem and remainder theorem before. If this vanishes, all you get left with over here is 6 plus 2, which is equal to a times 4. And you get the same, uh, that's 8, so you get the same result. Right? Uh, now, then of course you can do the same for b. Now, this is mm, kind of okay. I think it's alright, you'll get the right answer, obviously, and you'd, you'd get a tick on an exam. The reason why I'm a little bit iffy about it, and it's certainly not the first way that I showed you, is that there's just a teeny, teeny little problem with saying this. Has anyone noticed uh, that? <laughs> you, you really shouldn't, right? On this particular question, that exact value, in fact, the precise values you need to make this work, the reason why they work is because they make one of your denominators zero, okay? Now, as you've noticed, that ends up being, because I'm, I'm just ending up comparing the numerators, right? I'm just trying to solve for a and b, which has nothing to do with the denominator. So therefore, I'm kind of treating it as a secondary question now, in the same way that solving these simultaneously is a secondary question. At the same time, I'm just a little bit uncomfortable with saying something that I know is completely at odds with the way the question began. I think it's not the greatest pattern to set yourself up into because that's how students make errors, by forgetting, oh, there's domain restriction on this. Like, that's a, that is one of the most classic errors that any two unit or extension one or extension two student can make. So it'll get you the right answer fairly quickly as well. Maybe you want to use that as a confirmation for how you went through and the numbers that you ended up with, especially when you end up having a few more of them. Um, but just, just be cautious with it. Okay. Um, also, you can see the usefulness of this method starts to reduce. Like here, it's like, oh, cool. It just made the b vanish, right? Well, when you don't have two partial fractions, but when you're going to end up with not two, but three, you're going to have an a um, term, a b term, and then there's a c term. And there's no one number you can put in there that gets rid of two of the... Um, uh, two of the constants, right? You always end up with two of them left over. And so you end up back in this situation. Right? Do you see what I mean? So um, keep that in your back sleeve. The vast majority will end up with a pair of partial fractions. So you know what? It's not bad, right? 
Um, just like factorizing is, is quite useful, even though you can't factorize everything. Sometimes you need the quadratic formula. But um, I would use this as my mainline approach. Okay.